Hello everyone, we are Céline Nicolas, Laure Vergonzan and Gaël Degout. We will present a paper about our experimentations regarding ancient clothing and this is Gaël speaking. We work in the visitor service team of the Gallo-Roman Museum of saint romain en galle situated along the River Rhône in the Rhône district and 30 kilometers far from Lyon in France. The museum hosts some of the artifacts and mosaics that were found in the neighborhood of the antique city of Vienna, which was a very important center in Roman times located in the Gallia Narbonensis. The city of Vienna was situated on both sides of the river, but our archaeological site occupies only a small part of the right bank. In fact, the museum is located on the archaeological site itself, which is half unexcavated and is one of the most important Roman sites in France, both for the remains that have already been discovered and also because of all the mosaics that have been found from the 18th century until nowadays. We deeply encourage you to come and visit this place, as well as the current city of Vienne, where some Roman monuments are still standing. The teams of the museum started developing experimentations at the beginning of the 1980s. It began with lead pipes and pottery and is still going on with wine experiments, pitch, stone carving, bread and pottery again. You may find some scientific articles regarding all of these if it's relevant for you. Experimental archaeology is a part of the scientific project of our museum and will take even a bigger space in the renovated museum project that is conducted for the next years. We have been members of EXARC since 2016. We also conduct reenactment events every year for all the knowledge it can bring when you talk to the reenactors. In 2014, we initiated a research project about ancient Roman textiles and clothing, and we are now going to talk about this a little more. Some items related to fabric making are hosted in our museum, as well as in many others displaying Roman artifacts. Loom weights, spindle worlds, even one tablet with a triangular shape and metallic needles. And the archaeological site also provides two Fulonica, Fuller's workshop, used to take care of clothes. As we work in the visitor service department and are therefore in charge of all activities, such as guided tour with schools and the general public, we are always looking for a way to spread knowledge. We first used copies of typical Roman clothing made with contemporary material. But even though they were a first step conveying information to visitors, they were not completely satisfactory because they were not faithful to the textures and colors that can be observed on Roman wall paintings. We also wished we could understand the techniques involved to better share them with the visitors. That's why we initiated a research project in 2014 that consists in the recreations of garments using quite the same fibers that are hand sewn and most of the time undyed. We definitely want our visitors to understand what it could have been like to wear such clothes and they can experience it through all their senses. But it's not only the color, the softness or the astonishment of seeing light wool fabric. It's beyond that. We can testify that wearing recreated clothes has an effect on your gesture, the way you feel your body and your wall posture. For example, we recreated a 9 meter long toga, approximately 20 cubit or Roman cubitum, which is draped three times around the male model's body and starts and ends on the left shoulder. Even someone who has never seen any Roman depiction of a togatus man, these models, whatever their age, have their left hand naturally grasped around the umbo that forms on the chest as seen on many Roman depictions. Our research is not as precise as the others presented in this conference because it lacks so much information that maybe, certainly, will never be found out, although we try to document our recreations as much as we can. We used archaeological studies related to the fibres, like the work of the Mons Claudianus project in Egypt, or the study of Philippe Borgard, Christophe Moulera, and Fabienne Medard on the textiles of Pompeii, but also to the dyes that have been found, Dominique Cardon's Big Bible. We also find studies on rare but quite well-preserved clothes from Roman antiquity all around the Mediterranean Sea. 
This brings us to choose wool most of the time with plain weave or twill. It also confirms some measurements and we try to make the clothes using the Roman cubitum unit. We invite our dear Pliny the Elder and some other Roman authors for any welcome information they can provide about dyeing, clothes making or wearing garments. But we must admit that it is still quite limited compared to all the questions we would like to ask them. Roman wall paintings or statues are a great source too. It's not always certain that they provide depictions of real clothes, but sometimes what we see matches what the Roman authors say and even what archaeologists found, so we look at them as quite relatable sources for our purpose. We have developed a weird tendency which is looking at disregarded aspects of the statue, trying to find clues concerning hems, marked folds or stripes, knots, belts and weights. How rich in details Roman statues are, and we are weirdos frightening our museum colleagues all over the world, looking under tunics, on napes and under armpits, many places providing so much information. We paid a visit to the Museo Archeologico Nazionale di Napoli, the Naples National Archaeological Museum, and observed many interesting details, such as what seems to us weights on some aristocratic and expensive man coat. We bet some of you are already looking at statues in the same way as us, and we hope everybody will start doing so tomorrow. Forgive us for this little humorous trait, and let's go back to the real purpose of this talk. To summarize, our clothes are not copies, but as we said, recreations that are in spite of what may have been and the technique skills that were known at the time. We already explained the difficulties that lead to this fact, but there is another huge lack of information that is tacit knowledge. It's the way you gain some knowledge by observation and personal experience. Every morning, putting on your daily clothes is a result of tacit knowledge. You never had a lecture about clothing when you were a toddler, and yet you know how to get dressed properly. Tacit knowledge is involved in many of the daily aspects of our lives, and so it was for the Roman people. We will never have full information about the ancient tacit knowledge of clothing, but we can try our best, and that's what we are currently doing. In this last part, let us present one of our set of clothes to describe a small step we are glad to share with you all. In 2017, we wanted to study the Empress Sabina because our reenactment event was about Hadrian. We looked for some depictions of Vibia Sabina, some in Italy and one located in France. It was the statue that adorned the Roman theater in Vaison la Romaine antique city. The statue is a great scale. The Empress is standing. Here's the way she is often described. She is wearing a long chiton from her shoulders to her feet, which seems made of very fine fabric that forms many pleats. It seems to be made of two rectangles assembled from the neck to the arm. The rectangles are joined with small knots that form characteristic pleats. Between each couple of knots, there is a little amount of fabric resulting from the stretching. The sleeve is adjusted to the arm and a little bit stretched at the end just above the elbow. The right arm is wrapped inside a coat that runs around the statue and gathers behind the left elbow under the arm. For each garment we recreate, we try to do it for a specific person. Here we have the idea of Sabina, who was rich and would it incarnate the perfect Roman woman in her quality of first lady. Her clothes certainly conveyed some of these ideas immediately for those who were looking at her. Wealth must have allowed her to wear some rare materials, or rare colors, or both. We chose to use colors derived from real purple dye, but it was not possible in 2018 to obtain real purple shells from the south of France, so we made approaching colors using cochineal with another bust of wood blue for one of the pieces. To make it understandable instantly in quite the same way for our visitors, we choose the clothing pieces as following. An underdressed, used to cover the feet and to preserve her chastity and status, we made it out of silk, adapting a sleeveless tunic from the statue of the old woman in the Capitoline Museum in Rome. 
A dress, kind of a long tunic that seems to stop slightly under the knees, that can be seen on many other Roman depictions, such as wall paintings. We made ours out of wolf silk twill and recreated the small apertures on the sleeves, binding the two edges in small knots. We added false gold thread stitches on the collar and on the lower edge, which were inspired by foliage on some mosaics. We assumed that she would be wearing a belt, though it's not quite visible on the statue, and made it using the waving tablets technique with 80 threads, and adorned it with decorative stitching inspired for a Pompeii mosaic. Then a coat, which is quite long and seems to be the heaviest garment, is mostly placed on the left shoulder. She is literally wrapped in this coat, and some pleats here and there suggest that the coat is only adjusted on her left shoulder and under her left arm. But when we tried wrapping ourselves in the same way, it didn't work well. We made our test with a tin cubit coat of fine plain wool, approximately 4.5 meters long and 1.4 meters large. This is quite heavy. On other statues of women, we seem to observe the same type of wrapping. For example, the type of the great Herculanes that is in addition grasping the coat from the left shoulder to bring it to the right hand. At the bottom of the coat, in the front, we can observe a curve ascending from the right side to the left arm. Many women's statues feature this curve at different heights, varying from knees to ankles. Sometimes it's very clear that the coat is just wrapped around the body, from left shoulder to left arm. But this one not so the case in our Vaison la Romaine statue, at least it didn't seem to. We are also searching how you can obtain curves with a rectangular shape. Yes, it's indeed possible to weave something round, and there is no doubt that this was achievable in Roman times. But it must have been difficult to be accurate, and maybe some of you have tested it. We are eager to know if the edge wiggles due to the tension of the wrap. The edges of Roman coats are always neat and straight, and we never get to incorporate the ten cubits in the wrapping in an elegant way. So one day, Eureka! We folded the ten cubits in half, resulting in a five cubit coat, which is easier to manipulate, even for the Romans themselves. We assumed that the lady would have worn a belt, because we have little evidence of Roman women without a belt, and it certainly wouldn't be the case in high society if women of the time. The extremity of the fold is pulled under the belt and behind the left arm. The two parts of the coat are then separated. The underside goes over the right arm. Then the upper side is rolled along the waist or chest. Along the right side. Behind the body and is finally pulled again under the belt. It forms a kind of skirt around the lower part of the body. Depending on how much the underside is pulled over the arm, you create the round edge in front of the legs. Then the coat on the right shoulder covers the upper rear side of the body and ends over the left shoulder. This simple trick allows a person to dress herself or readjust her clothing. The upper part of the coat can also be used to cover the head thanks to the width of the fabric. The same coat can be worn in many ways because it has this rectangular shape. Our set of clothes are already finished and were presented to the public in 2018, but we have not yet confronted it with the original statue and are in contact with the head office in Vaison la Romaine Museum to proceed to the encounter. We have so many questions we would like to explore concerning Roman clothes and the way they were manufactured or worn, but because of tacit knowledge, many of them will not be answered. We conduct other experiments about natural dyeing, known in Roman times, that are more relatable to the experiments within a scientific framework. But we wanted to present another field of research using depictions as our main source. Experimental archaeology will still be conducted in our museum renovation project because we consider it as interesting as the study of the archaeological artifacts themselves. Well, we have reached the end of our presentation, but there are so many other things we would have liked to share with you. We hope this topic was of interest to you. You are welcome to contact us if you want to pursue the discussion and know more about our project.
We invite you to consult our YouTube page with a playlist dedicated to experimental archaeology, soon in English. Now take care, experiment a lot, and have a nice EAC 13. Bye!